Welcome. I think all of you all know who I am, but I'm Lee Carol Giddes, and I'm the interim executive director of Brahm, um, and very glad to be here. Um, this is the 21st annual meeting for Brahm, and I'm sure some of you are like, what? <laughs> um, didn't we just celebrate our 10th anniversary? But Brahm became a nonprofit in 2001 and began having annual meetings after that. As a matter of fact, I remember, as do many of you, <coughs> sitting in Rumpel's fellowship hall for an annual meeting while a shell of a building was on the property over here. Well, while an empty lot was on the property over here, but I was at one where this was a shell of a building. Um, we've come a long way, from a dream to a reality, from an envisioned museum to a vibrant community cultural center, bustling with exhibitions, educational opportunities, and programs. We are here because of you. Every one of you are members, and memberships are our foundation. A third or more of our operational budget is from memberships. Your memberships fund all the wonderful things about Brahm, but they also fund the electricity and the, you know, non-fun things, the electronics. Um, <laughs> so without memberships, we wouldn't have Brahm. So thank you for believing in this museum and for being here today. I will now turn the mic over to the president of the Board of Trustees, Dean Hamrick. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you. I think all of you join me in thanking Lee Carroll for coming back, taking the helm of this museum. I think we all feel the same way. And you know, come out of retirement, she loves this museum, she came back, and you, know, she, you let it and got us right back on track as you did for many, many years. So thank you very much. Stephen, you have big shoes to fill and you already know that, I think. So. <laughs> well, I'd like to begin by just sharing a few highlights of 2022. Um, I think we can all agree it was a year of transition for Brahm. You know, we had so many wonderful moments, but we also had some difficult moments. You know, we made decisions that were right, that were courageous for this museum. And we're now in a better and stronger place. And that's because of the leadership of our executive committee and because of the leadership of our board. We never lost our enthusiasm for our work here at Brahm. And so many of you in this room stepped to the plate and our museum has emerged stronger than ever and more determined than ever, I would say. Now, to be the force that has been for the arts here in our community and region for the past 11 years. So thank you very much for all that you've done, your advice, your counsel over the last year. We had a lot to celebrate in 2022. We had a number of important exhibitions, including uh, the stunning paintings by John Bierman. We had Coast to Coast, which was you know, a gorgeous exhibition of American Impressionist work. Then we had Jagged Path, for which the exhibition and the programming will long be remembered by everyone here. And a special you know, a shout out to Gabe and to Willard for the programming and just the, the whole, everything that accompanied that show was just memorable in every way. And we thank you for your leadership there. Our education area, what a star that is with Brahm. And it rebounded in a grand way. And, and that was both in enrollments and in community outreach. 1,144 students came to Brahm on field trips at no charge. We had 329 students attend art classes, and we were able to bring Kayla on board to help Jennifer with this expanded growth in offerings. Plein Air was a phenomenal success again. Uh, we sold out early last year, and we've already sold out this year uh, once again. Also, during 2022, we had 25 individuals step to the plate and commit to naming Brahm as a part of their estate. Now, this was such an important achievement in the life of our museum, and it ensures that our museum will continue its important work in our region for generations to come. Then we couldn't do what we do without our amazing staff. They're all lined up at the back, uh, but they exceed our expectations on a daily basis and they excelled at their work during an uncertain time. Let's give them a huge round of applause. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Amazing, amazing team. They're the glue that holds this museum together each and every day, and we thank you for all that you do for us. 
We have a new exciting year underway already. Uh, we look forward to the coming months. Um, as you know, the Alex Hintz luncheon is sold out, as is the dinner ahead of that. Thanks to Marion Church and Lee Giles for their ladyship. The Gardenia exhibition opens on June 24th, which you'll all want to see. And then the enthusiasm for our gala on August 26th is truly unbelievable. We're going to sell that out this year, 300 people. So if you haven't bought your tickets, you better get them soon. And our sponsorships, I think I can say this perhaps, but uh, we've already got $35,000 in sponsorships committed already. So we're off to a grand start with the gala. So I'm happy to say today that Brahm is doing extraordinarily well. And that's because of your commitment, because of your work, and your support of this museum. We're strong financially, and we're well positioned for a very bright future. But we are depending on each of you to continue to be a part of this journey with us as we enter this new chapter at Braun. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric Overcash to give our financial report. Thank you, Dean. When I was, when I was preparing this financial report, I was hoping to find a way to make this fun and make it, <laughs> make it, make it entertaining so I could keep your attention. Um, it is important information, but I'm not quite sure how exciting it will be, so bear with me. So. As of December 31st, 22, assets total 8,972,000. That was down 479,000 from the same time from the previous year. This decrease was due to primarily to a decrease in donations given for specific purposes, a decrease in fixed assets due to depreciation, and a change in value of our investment and endowment funds. This year, we did not enjoy the steady increases of recent years from the stock market. This is normal for most funds today. We're constantly talking about making sure we're invested in the best funds. That's every meeting we have, we talk about that. So our cash available total $358,000 and our investment portfolio endowment funds total 1,803,000. Liabilities total 96,000, with total equity or net worth being 8,876,000. That is a debt to equity of around 1%. We're solid, like uh, Dean said. Year in revenues total 966,000, up 106,000 from the previous year with the event revenue, memberships, and sponsorships being the largest driver of revenues. Expenses total 997,000, an increase of 149,000 year over year with payroll expenses continuing to be our largest expense item. We're fortunate that the majority of our expenses are fixed annually. <coughs> Fundraising was not emphasized during the last six months of 2022. And with Lee Carroll currently helping and Stephen soon in place, fundraising is, is currently and will be up front and center. This will also rem be remedied by the success of the Al Alex Heights dinner and luncheon, as Dean mentioned, in June. Both sold out quickly. We're all excited about the potential, potential for our gala this year. And when we accomplish those big numbers that Dean said, that's going to be a big boost in our, in our, uh, our money situation. Um, and also, of course, hiring a Stephen, our new director, he's got a proven track record and extensive experience in fundraising. So we've got a good year ahead of us. In summary, we recognize our weak areas. We have plans in place to strengthen these things. Also, our fin finance committee has implemented updated reporting to be even more transparent in the financial operations area. 
Brahm has a strong balance sheet, is liquid, and has little debt, as I mentioned. Further, we have never tapped into accumulated dividends that have been available to spend through the years. There's been some challenges this in uh, 22, but, but we have an exceptional finance committee guiding us um, and making prudent recommendations to the board. So I think you can feel good about the direction we're heading. The members of the finance committee is Terry Wiley, Joe Cohn, Sean Poole, and Sam Hess. Uh, also, Lee Carroll has, when she came back, she's been involved close with our committee, uh, with her experience through the years. Dean Hammock also involved with our committee and uh, just recently chairing the finance committee. Um, and last but not least, Sharon Caldwell, back here, number two on the wall. Um, <laughs> her, her financial knowledge and untiring work for the efforts uh, on the committee. So with a virtual who's who of financial experts, I'm not one of those, but the committee is. Uh, my job has been a real pleasure. And uh, we've got a great, a great group to make sure we're, we're headed, headed down the right path. Due to, and I'll again, uh, some of the things Lee Carroll mentioned and pile on, due to the wonder, wonderful generosity of you folks in this room and the many supporters of Brahm, we have come a long ways in the, the 10 or so years and the future's bright too. It is, I'm so excited as to where we're headed, our direction today, not just financially, but all the services we offer in the community. It's, um, we're, we're going to grow into the future. We have really something special here at Brom and Blowing Rock. I'm just happy to be a part of it, so thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for your leadership. We have an exceptional finance committee. They work tirelessly to ensure that we are, we are positioned financially as for a great future here. And thank you, Eric. Thank you. Uh, Sam Hess is on that. You mentioned Terry Wiley, of course, uh, also. But it's, it is a great committee. Okay, uh, Sandy has the pleasure of introducing our new director. Good afternoon. I'm happy to be here. I need to see. I'm getting old. Um, I do have the pleasure of introducing Stephen today, and I'm very, very excited about that for two reasons. He's going to be a great director, and I can really sign off now. <laughs> but before we get started, I would be remiss if I didn't thank so many people. Um, first of all, the search committee. Um, Teresa Kane, she was our, um, well, she just kept us calm in all of the storm. <laughs> and I just love her to death. She's the best. Bo Henderson, who's not here today, he, he drove me around everywhere I had to go, and I really appreciate that. Cindy Milner, uh, she was awesome, and um, Bo and Cindy, they um, provided accommodations for all the candidates when they came to town free of charge. They fed them. They fed all of us, uh, the search committee, all the board members and patrons that came to the different lunches and dinners. So big shout out to them for doing that. Um, Dean, of course, um, was uh, a guiding force on our search committee. And we had Lee Carroll this year, this time as an advisor this time around. So we appreciate her a lot. Um, there was a lot of hard work and a lot of sacrifice of time and talent for countless hours. So um, just a big shout out to them. Let's give whoever's here a, an applause. Yeah. 
Well, one thing the search committee really tried to do was um, with these candidates, as we were going through the interview process, and there's a very extensive one before they, uh, any of these people ever get to town. So, but we tried to picture them and all the different uh, circumstances they would be in. We tried to picture them here in the museum with the staff, which is very important, um, with patrons, with stakeholders, with the community, working with the chamber. We tried to picture them with the town council, just every scenario possible. And Stephen just fit every one of those, like, I mean, A plus. So um, just, He's just awesome. I'm so glad to be introducing him. <laughs> I just have to say that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we just knew uh, he was the one. And um, uh, I'm so excited to introduce him as our new executive director. He comes from the Ronalda House and Museum of Art in Winston-Salem, as most of you know. He had 12 years of experience there. I just, um, I just loved all the comments from his, um, his uh, colleagues at Ronalda House when they found out he was coming. I mean, you know, they said that his 12 years there had prepared him to be successful in this job and that we were really getting a gem and we know that we are. And um, uh, just, God, you guys just don't know how excited I am. <laughs> I believe his experience is just gonna take this museum to the next level. And uh, we have Ash County in common. He and his partner, Chris, they have a home there and I was raised there and it, it, I'm just happy to introduce Stephen, and he's our speaker today, so come on up here, Stephen. And he's very tall. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. <clears throat> Sandy, thank you so much. That was the best introduction I've ever had. <laughs> when Sandy, Sandy and I met, she was like, is it okay if we hug? And I was like, uh, it'd be a problem if we didn't, so. <laughs> That's good. I do want to thank all the members of the board, um, Dean, um, Sandy, all the members of the search committee. Um, this is just an, an amazing opportunity for me and uh, a life-changing opportunity and really a dream come true. So I hope that I can share that with you. That's me, by the way. I was going to put a, um, a photo when I had hair, but then I thought y'all would be confused and that wouldn't be good and that sort of thing. So anyway. Um, more appreciation, of course, goes out to Lee Carroll. Um, just so you know, we will start, um, I'm calling it orientation. <laughs> we'll start orientation on Wednesday um, throughout the month of June. And then um, <clears throat> a number of fine folks have invited me to uh, come to cocktail parties and dinners, which you like to do here in Blowing Rock, which is great. I love that. So we're excited about that. Um, but I really am thrilled to start this next chapter. Um, Dean asked that I share a few examples of some of the things that we've done at Renolda House, um, some community outreach and that sort of thing. I'd also like to just give you a background about why museums are important to me personally. Um, and I think, Dean, you said about two and a half hours, is that right? Okay, great. <laughs> so, um, really, the love of museums starts for me at a very early age, very early age. Um, I'm the youngest of eight just so you're aware. Um, and we grew up in Midland, Texas. And I think there's only two people who, that I know of in the room who've been to Midland, Texas. Right, Bert? You've been? Right. Chris has been. Um, they can tell you a little bit about Midland, Texas later. We won't talk about that now. But um, most people know Midland for oil, maybe baby Jessica. Um, I think about the culture and the arts, uh, opera, ballet, symphony, all in this relatively small town in West Texas. So um, the museum that I grew up with in Midland was a, uh, or is today, a historic house with a contemporary gallery that's been added to it. 
for those of you who know Renolda House, that may sound familiar to you. Um, and when I arrived at Renolda, I was like, hmm, this all seems very familiar. So, um, you know, Renolda, of course, is a historic house um, with its gallery. But my family, we, we traveled out from Midland. So, um, and this seems strange for folks in North Carolina, um, but uh, we would go as far as Fort Worth and Dallas for museum travel. Um, those museums are about 300 miles away. Um, it wasn't uncommon for us to all pack into our gold Mercury station wagon and uh, with black vinyl seats. Not a smart thing in West Texas, by the way. Um, and we would go to museums. Um, one of my favorites is the Kimball in Fort Worth. If you, haven't, if you haven't been to that museum, it's an absolutely glorious museum. And I think there are so many nice parallels with Brahm and the Kimball. Incredible architecture that makes you feel at home and welcomed and um, really allows you to experience beautiful European paintings in the case of the Kimball. So now, um, let me give you a quick sidebar about Midland. Um, and uh, Jennifer and I were talking about this a moment ago. Midland is the gateway to Marfa, Texas. I'm looking across over here at the Kellys. Um, and Marfa, Texas is a place that so many people want to go, but it's so remote that they're reluctant to do that. And let me just say, it's so remote, you're probably going to be reluctant to do it. But let's talk about it. Maybe there's a trip in our future where we would go to Marfa. We'll stop off in Midland, um, and uh, we'll get to see some of the minimalist art, right, um, that is housed in Marfa, which is the most interesting spot in the world. People from all over come to this little town of 800 people in West Texas just to see art. Pretty amazing stuff. So. Um, but like... Many families, museums created shared understanding and shared interest, excuse me, shared interest um, for all eight of us, well, plus our parents. Um, and they also created a great space for us to really explore not only art, but we traveled for historic sites. Um, we went to aviation museums and auto museums and that sort of thing. Um, my father, um, being astute and a CPA, um, chose these spots because a lot of them are free. So we travel to um, free places. So my family continues to travel together. And uh, we're actually headed to Dallas. Chris and I are headed to Dallas next week to be with my family. And we're going to be heading to a few museums. And we're going to a uh, car show at the Dallas Arboretum. So that's going to be interesting, too. So. Oh, um, wait, before I go any further, I was going to explain to you guys how Miss America changed my life. So um, this is one of those things I should have given you a preamble for this. Um, so in 1986, Texas celebrated its 150th anniversary as an independent republic. Notice that. They didn't celebrate the 150th anniversary of being a state, but as an independent republic. So um, they hosted a big event in Austin, and all the, the who's who of Texas entertainers performed for one night, and it was broadcast on uh, ABC. Now, that was back in the day when TV meant something, right? And you could say that you were on one of the major networks, and so that was kind of an exciting thing. But Boz Skaggs and Sandy Duncan and Tommy Tune and all of these famous Texans. And I was responsible for creating the VIP section for the event. So the VIPs were seated at round tables and then everyone else was up in the stadium seats around and about. So you're wondering what Miss America has to do with this. I know, Dean. You like get to the point. <laughs> but um, Phyllis George Brown was Miss Texas and she was Miss America and she was the first lady of Kentucky. She liked my work and she said, I want you to come to Kentucky and help me with a gala. And I, of course, said, Okay. She explained later that the gala would be on the uh, horse farm that belonged to Cornelius Vanderbilt Whitney and Mary Lou Whitney. Wasn't a shabby spot, I gotta say. I mean, surrounded by all of these horse paintings, it was uh, kind of nice. But that really started my career working with special events, galas, using those types of events as fundraiser activities for not-for-profits and that sort of thing. So um, when I say that Miss America changed my life, it truly is. 
Um, when I, the other thing that happened for me in Kentucky was really starting to fall in love with a place of beauty. So when I talk to you about Midland, Texas, it's not necessarily a pretty place. Um, and when I got to Kentucky, I was like, wow, this is beautiful. So it wasn't until a few years later, when I was transferred to North Carolina, that I had that same experience again. When I fell in love with place, because of the beauty of the place. And then I must say, it took me four months when I first arrived in North Carolina. It took me four months to get to Balloon Rock. But my first visit, I was hooked. And I've been trying to get back here ever since. And so thank you all for making that happen. Um, and. Uh, you know, as mentioned, I've been with Renolda for about 13 years. What I, what I wanted to do with a little bit of time today is talk about um, one aspect of my job. Now, so many parts of my job included great travel. I'm looking at Teresa and Linda and Ed. We've been on some great trips together. Um, and lots of fundraising events, lots of fundraising for capital and all those kinds of things, all important to the museum. But I want to talk about how um, we did some unique collaborations with the community and what that meant. So let's see if I'm on the right slide. Oh, wait, I forgot. This is Marfa, by the way. <laughs> so when you're ready to go and stand in the desert and look at some concrete boxes, um, I'm your man. So just let me know. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so let's talk about, um, we'll talk about an exhibition, we'll talk about um, a, uh, a special way that we connected with another not-for-profit organization, and then we'll um, talk about a very special day where we brought um, some of the most vulnerable members of the community to Rinaldo. So to start with this exhibition, um, it was called Love and Loss. And, and you know, many artists respond to grief in their work. And we've seen it, we know it, we've, we've um, experienced those paintings very powerful work, um, whether it be painting or sculpture, um, the outpouring of grief, anger, sadness, guilt, all come through um, in the voice of the creator. But this was an interesting idea when we brought together pieces that only had that thematic idea to them. So pieces from Renaldo House pers um, permanent collection and then also some um, very selected loans. Prior to the opening of the exhibition, we had third year students from Wake Forest University, the uh, School of Medicine, who worked with their faculty members to create a program that would associate to the works in the exhibition. The program was designed to assist medical professionals be more empathetic in their practice. It also um, touched on palliative care and end of life issues. An abbreviated version of the program was in the gallery itself so that folks could experience that too. The exhibition was made possible through a sponsorship with an organization that was called the Northwest Area Health Education Center, or Northwest AHEC. And they're a group that gives continuing education credits to healthcare professionals. They all the way up to this area. So we worked with them and they took the program and actually made it so that healthcare professionals could receive continuing education credits by coming and experiencing the exhibition and the associated program. So this really was a game changer of an opportunity for us to dig deep into uh, one aspect of Winston-Salem, the healthcare industry, and have a downstream impact on those medical professionals. The exhibition was so popular, even though the subject matter was difficult, the exhibition was so popular, we kept it open for an additional six months and then began working with um, the area hospice organizations and palliative care organizations. So really was so interesting to have this opportunity. And all started with a single idea and a conversation with one of our educators about a work in the collection that stemmed from the artist grief over the loss of their daughter. So you all know this image. Um, and while you know this image, you might not know the full scope of Dorothea Lang's work. 
Uh, Dorothea Lange, of course, was working as a photographer during the Depression, and she captured this photo. So we had conversations that this exhibition would be a difficult one at Rinalda, first and foremost, because it had such a, a huge iconic image, but then what was next? And how would people connect to Dorothea Lang? So with that challenge, um, we started a partnership with um, the Food Bank of Northwest North Carolina. And the partnership actually took us, in advance of the exhibition, we did joint fundraising calls. We raised money together for both the exhibition and for Food Bank. We developed programs that helped the uh, community learn about people who are living in, in Winston-Salem with food insecurity. And the, um, one of the pieces that we created associated to this was created jointly by both organizations, both the museum and by Food Bank. It's a tabloid style piece that was inserted into both newspapers in Winston-Salem that told the story of Dorothea Lange's work and migrant mother, but also connected it to people living in Winston-Salem, Forsyth County, who were suffering with food insecurity. All of our marketing materials carried that same messaging. <clears throat> Folks were invited to come to the exhibition and uh, offer, or they were offered complimentary admission if they brought food that was later then donated to Food Bank. So it really sort of immersed us in the whole experience associated to folks living with food insecurity. Um, the, the connection between the two organizations continues. Just this past week, the Cannon Foundation hosted a dinner at Rinalda to highlight the partnership between Food Bank and Rinalda House. And um, we were really quite excited about that opportunity to work with Cannon Foundation in that way. So since the 1970s, Rinalda has done a community day. Community day is a day when uh, all are welcomed and to come to the museum free of charge. There are art activities on the lawn and those art activities generally connect to the exhibition in the museum. And this event, as sometimes events can happen, looking across at the staff, you know, it can be like rinse and repeat, right? We're going to rinse and repeat. So Community Day had turned into a bit of a rinse and repeat until this past year, when we really shook things up. And for the first time, we had a partnership between Renolda House, the United Way, and the Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools. Truly, um, I think one of these uh, partnerships that we have, will, it'll be very interesting to see what happens in the future, but let me tell you a little bit about what actually happened on that day. The United Way has, in Winston-Salem, something that calls Place Matters, where they've identified the most vulnerable parts of the community. And um, by working with the school system, they were able to give very deliberate, very personalized invitations to these folks to ask them to come to Community Day and experience Community Day. United Way was responsible for the invitation. They also incentivized folks to come and bring their families. The school system supplied lunch. They also supplied a backpack as people left out with food for the week, and um, also transportation to get to the museum. So it was really amazing. Um, we, in initial meetings, we dreamed of having 30 people come. We really hoped that we would get up to 50. We ended with 400. So it's very exciting. And it just shows you that when we think about people who are vulnerable and um, their lives are so different from ours, we think about do they have time to insert art in there? And they do. We just have to make it available and make those opportunities available and work hard to do that. 
So, um, I will say one thing that's very interesting about this collaboration, due to subject matter of the 2024 exhibition season at Renolda House, the school system is not able to work with Renolda. But they're going to work with another arts organization. So, while um, one might think, oh gosh, well we missed that opportunity, what we, what we did was we gave birth to something that's actually gonna go forth, carry on. It's really quite exciting. But just three examples of collaboration, and I know Brahm does collaboration really well. Working with the community, um, and it's, a, it's just such an important aspect of the work that we do. Um, these are not marketing ideas. These are ideas where we're actually connecting with people in the most meaningful way. So, um, I know that uh, that's only part of the story, and it's part of my story, but for the next few weeks, maybe months, I'm not gonna tell any more of my story, because I wanna hear about your stories, and I wanna hear why museums are important to you, and why Brahm is such an important part of your heart. And together, then, we're gonna weave together a plan to carry us forward. Lee Carroll's brought us, and the staff has brought us to this point, and I thank you very much for that. Again, you deserve another round of applause, as does the staff. But for me, when I think about this place, I want us to be thinking about the impact that we're having on the people who are crossing the threshold. What's our downstream impact with these folks? You know, it might be that someone who walks in the door dreams one day of becoming the director at a museum that they love. So, that's our challenge. It's our downstream impact to think about every individual who crosses our threshold. And I just wanna say that one of the parts of my life that I live by, um, and I know our education team thinks about this daily, but um, we really hear are not necessarily making impact based on huge numbers, right? Sometimes huge numbers, it's not necessarily what we do, but it's the individual that we change their life when they come in. Like Miss America changed my life. <laughs> like the Brahm has changed my life. Like each one of you has changed my life. I thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I think we made a good choice. How about you? Yeah. <laughs> We're so excited to have you here, and we really can't wait to see where you lead us in this new chapter of our museum. Our nominations committee brought another great slate of candidates this year to our board. I'd like to thank Gene Wilkinson, I'd like to thank Brent Moore and Terry Wiley for their work earlier this year, and Terry's gonna come give their report. So, Terry Wiley, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, I picked up a non-COVID, old-fashioned summer cold, so lucky me, but uh, it's, it's impacting my voice just a little. Um, first, I'd like to introduce the first-term uh, new board members that uh, we have, and the first one is Virginia Delaney. Virginia is, uh, and her husband Joe have been involved in museums through the years. She's a consummate volunteer here in Blowing Rock, as well as in Charlotte. She's with the, has been involved with the Charlotte Symphony, the YWCA, the Thompson Child and Family Focus, the Board of Brothers Foundation, as well as the Board of Charlotte Junior League. She's an active member of St. Martin's Episcopal Church and Christ Episcopal Church. She served as the Director of Financial Development for the YWCA, YMCA, uh, Director of Lay Ministries at Christ Church, and she enjoys reading, gardening, the arts, fitness, spending time with her seven grandchildren. So thank you, welcome, Virginia. Our other first term uh, new member is Joan Zimmerman. Joan, and she's not here. Well, let me just tell you a little bit about Joan because I think she's an incredible candidate. Joan and her husband created and ran the Southern Shows for 50 years, and Southern Shows conducted more than 20 major art exhibits shows annually. She's a former uh, member and chair of the Charlotte branch of the Richmond Federal Reserve and served on the board in leadership roles in many organizations, including Discovery Place, Queens University, United Way, Presbyterian Hospital. And in 2005, she was inducted into the North Carolina Business Hall of Fame. Uh, she's been very involved with the, uh, as an uh, entrepreneur in residence for the McCall School at Queens University 
and, and she has endowed a scholarship at the Penland School. So we're real excited about getting Joan on the board. <clears throat> we have uh, four returning members that are, who will start their second term who've been on the board at least once, some of them in cases many, including Sue Glenn. <clears throat> Eric Obercash, who's also our treasurer. Mary Ann Poole, Ann. and Jean Wilkison. Then we have um, a number of folks who have, have one to two years remaining of their three-year term commitments, including Dean, our president, Dan McClam, our vice president, Dan. <laughs> Canty Tanner, who serves as our secretary. Not here. Okay. Uh, Joe Coyne, <laughs> Sandy Huff, our incredible past president, uh, Andrea Burns, Andrea, Marion Church, Katie Dean, uh, Brent Moore. Lee Rokamora, Maria Satterbo, Jess Weirman, and me. Thank you. The voice made it to the end. Me again. And glasses again. So unfortunately, some people rotate off the board. <clears throat> there are people who go through life wanting center stage and credit for all that they do. There's nothing wrong with that. But then there are people who engage quietly, who sit in the room listening, who don't speak up often, but when they do it is from a thoughtful and wise place. Their gifts of time, knowledge, and funding are done quietly and without fanfare, but their impact is deep and lasting. Today, I recognize one of those people, small but also giant. Teresa Kane has been involved with Brahm from its earliest days. She's hosted many a social and fundraising event for Brahm. She liked being on the board so much, she came back again and again. <laughs> she has served on many committees, and most recently, the executive committee of the board and on the director search committee. I'm a believer in term limits, but Teresa, we sure hate for your terms to be over. Please, let's thank Teresa Kane. And you have to come up. I'm here. Wait, before you come up here, Dean, one more person that needs recognition. There is one other person due recognition. Well, there are probably a lot more. Being president of a healthy nonprofit should be easy, rewarding, even fun. But it isn't always. You could be Bo Henderson and have to deal with the difficult employee situation on your third day as president. You could be Sandy Huff, who had all the enjoyment of the pandemic. Or you could be Dean Hamrick and get a leadership transition twice. Dean has been the right person at the right time for Braun. He's increased engagement of the board and committees. He's been, a steady, he's been steady and present. He's been dedicated beyond measure. Braun could not have had better leadership this past year, Dean. And Bert, <laughs> thank you. I'm going to kill her too. Thank you. Thank you. Well, wow. you know, we love this museum for so many reasons. It's people like Teresa, Lee Carroll, Sandy, and so many names that you've heard here today. And that's why we're involved, because we love the community of Brahm and the work that Brahm does here also. Let me just echo Lee Carroll's comments. Uh, you know, Teresa. You've just always been such a stabilizing force here at our museum. You've been a leader, you're a founder, 
and you've been an integral part of our success through the years, and we just thank you for all that you've done. You're not going anywhere, by the way. <laughs> Don't get any ideas. You know, there really are no words to express my appreciation to the executive committee. Uh, they work unrelenting for this museum. The time, the devotion that they have given, especially over the last year, is just second to none. Certainly a special bond was established over the last year. They have an enormous commitment to steering Brahm and when needed making difficult decisions and recommendations to our board. And I'd like to each of them to stand. Canty Tanner, Eric Overcast, Dan McClam, Teresa Kane, and Sandy Huff. Thank you, thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you and the same can be said for our outstanding board of directors. We just have incredible leadership, our committee leaders, and we see their handprint in education and exhibitions and collections, finance, membership, and just about everything that they touch here at our museum. So I want to ask the whole group to stand one more time where you can thank them for their work. And all the board, please stand. Thank you. Incredible, incredible board. Thank you. I've worked with a lot of boards through the years, but I've never worked with a board like this, and we're just incredibly fortunate to have the talent and the skills that we have on our board. There is one other person I'd like to recognize, and that's Sandy Huff. Uh, Sandy is and has been a tremendous leader for our museum. While she was president, we saw Brom thrive during an epidemic that we'd never seen in our lifetime. She was a stabilizing force during a chaotic time here at Brom. She's worked closely with our board and our finance committee to ensure that we remain strong financially and that we emerge in a position to move forward confidently. She was a major force behind our legacy society that I mentioned earlier, which we have 25 members who are naming Brahm in their will. This ensures that our future is secure for many years to come. She's led our search committee two times. <laughs> She worked tirelessly with our committee in putting countless hours to conduct a nationwide search that's resulted now in Stephen being named our director to lead us going forward. She's a consummate volunteer. She's a proven leader who has a deep passion for Brahm. She's also a great mentor and friend of mine. And Randy, we are not having an affair regardless of what everybody <laughs> says. But we talk all the time. We're together all the time. <laughs> but, her impact will be felt for many, many years to come. So please join me in a resounding round of applause to express our appreciation to Sandy for all that she has done.